Hello and welcome to LSBF TV for AAT students. This is indirect tax, which is going to mean a VAT extravaganza. My name is Paul Merrison and I am going to be taking you through some, but not all, of the 10 weeks of television shows, presentations, call them what you will, together with some of my colleagues as we go through not just one sample assessment, but actually some bits of a second one as well. So, during these 10 weeks, I'm going to be taking you through all of those things. And we're going to be seeing how we go about answering the questions, making our lives as simple as we possibly can, so that when you sit this thing for real, you will maximize your wonderful scores. We're going to be focusing today on task number one, uh, and I'll talk to you about what task one is uh, in a second or two. But before I talk to you about the actual task, I need to talk to you about something very, very important that will help you to get through this indirect tax assessment, even if you're lacking confidence, even if you have no idea of the stuff you're meant to have learned and your brain has gone dead, there is a solution that is going to help you in most cases. Because for all of the tax assessments on AAT, including this one, you get reference material. You'll find this typically in blue ink and it's listed on the right hand side of the screen. So when you do the actual assessment You'll find this, as I said, on the right hand side, it will be a, a list of contents and you can click on any of those and go and read the reference material that is there. You do not want to be doing that for the first time when you're doing the actual assessment, because if you've never read a book before, how are you going to find the things you want? Now, the list is actually quite informative itself. So if you are guessing, you've got a pretty good chance of guessing the right place to look. But my advice is before you do this assessment for real, go practice the sample assessments on AAT's website. But one time you practice, don't bother actually doing the questions. I mean, you should do them at some point, clearly. But open it up, start the assessment, ignore the questions, and just practice going up and through and down the reference material, making sure you're getting to grips with what's inside it. In fact, I would say the day before you do the assessment for real, I'd go and do a practice assessment and just get to grips with that reference material. So many of the factual answers, so the non-numbers ones, the ones without calculations, are in the reference material because VAT has got a lot of rules, dates, amounts at which VAT does now become payable, doesn't become payable. There's a lot of rules and administration and your assessment tasks will be asking some of that stuff. As we go through the 10 weeks of assessments, I and my colleagues will point out which bits of answers you can find in the reference material, but you need to go and take a look yourself. Another thing uh, about the assessment. When we go through the assessment today, uh, and here it is, uh, I'm going to be writing things on the screen as so. When you do the assessment for real, typically these boxes will have drop down menus. Not the numbers ones, the ones where you have to put a number in, you'll have to calculate it and you'll have to type it. But things like 
these ones, you may well just be able to click the box and then select the item that you want to appear inside it. But we're not doing the real actual assessment on the AAT's website. We've downloaded and typed it up so we can take it rather more simply in the studio. So I'm going to be writing stuff in. Okay. So I suppose it is time for us to get going. So just to repeat, what we're about to do is task number one from an AAT actual sample assessment. So what are AAT trying to assess in task number one on the indirect tax paper? They are testing sources of information regarding VAT. So where do you find out what the rules, the regulations, the thresholds, the tax rates, where do you find that out if you are a business? It's also testing your knowledge of the registration process and also the thresholds for registration. If you only sell one item for 55p in a year, I doubt the tax authorities are going to be that bothered about you. But once you're up and running as a seriously sized business, there's going to be quite a bit of VAT swilling around in there and they're going to require you to register so that you can then make sure you're paying over the right amount of tax to them. And another task that could come up on the day of your assessment is what happens if you fail to register, what will then occur, penalties, etc. So you might call this the basics of VAT. We'll also see that we get some basic calculations in here. And with all of that in mind, it is probably a good idea that we stop talking about it and we get on and deal with it. So let's look at A part one. A business reached the VAT registration threshold six months ago, which means they should have registered for VAT but they did not register for VAT. Naughty, naughty. It has since charged £42,000 to customers for standard rated taxable supplies. So customers have been charged £42,000 this business is not registered for VAT, but it should have been. The question then says in A part one, how much will the business have to pay HMRC, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, in respect of output tax, in other words, on sales revenue, for its period of non-registration, in other words, from the point at which it should have registered up until now. Well, that all rather depends on how that 42,000 is to be viewed. And at that point, it's useful if we just break out of this for a moment and look at how VAT works.
So VAT, value added tax, is a tax added on to quite a lot of items that get sold. Not all, some are exempt. And typically, if it's standard rated, we're talking about 20% of tax. So you need to get comfortable, if you're not already comfortable, with working this in both directions. So if something would have had a price of £100 without VAT, 20% VAT would be added on, meaning that if I am the customer of this business, I'd be paying 120. As far as the company is concerned, that's its sales revenue, 100. The 20 pounds extra it gets from the customer is VAT, and that will have to be paid on to Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. So what's happening here is the government has found a very clever way of getting companies to collect tax on its behalf. Fantastic for the government, tax revenue, and they don't have to spend any time or effort collecting it. Companies have to do it. So you need to be comfortable that if the standard rate of VAT is 20%, as it is at the moment, take the net price, add on the VAT, and you get the gross. But what if it's to be calculated in the opposite direction? What if you've been given the 120 and you've been asked to either calculate the net price or the VAT? Well, let's have another example and get the numbers down as low as we dare. If the net price is five, 20% or one fifth of five is one, meaning the price that the customer pays is six, which means the net price is five sixths of the total and the VAT is one sixth of the total. Now don't worry if you forget that it's 20%. Don't worry if you forget this rather useful thing about the one-sixth of the total being VAT, one-fifth of the net, but one-sixth of the total price that's paid, because all of that is found in the reference material that you have in the exam while you're doing it. So if you had to look it up, you could. So that is how the VAT calculation works. As I said, you need to be comfortable with doing this in either direction, Let's now take a look at what the question said. It said 42,000 was charged to customers for standard rated taxable supplies. Well, if 42 was charged to customers, it looks to me, maybe we should do this up above, that the 42,000 is what the customer pays. And therefore, if that is six sixths, the VAT will be one sixth and the net price will be five sixths. That's what it's looking like to me. But let's go back up to the question because we haven't quite read it all yet. It says the business has chosen to treat the amount charged as that inclusive which is what I'd already assumed was going to be the right answer. So coming back down here, yep, 42,000 is what the customer has paid. Now let's give ourselves a bit more space down here. So net plus VAT equals price customer pays. Five sixths plus one sixth equals six sixths. And we now know that this is 42,000. Which means the VAT is going to be one sixth of that. 
And thankfully I don't need a calculator for this. My brain can just about handle it on a Friday afternoon. One sixth of 42 is seven. So the VAT is 7,000 and five sixths of 42 is 35,000. So the assumption now is that this company didn't have sales revenue of 42,000. Its financial statements are going to show that its sales revenue is 35,000. The 7,000 is VAT output tax which is now owed to HMRC and the 42,000 is what the customers paid. So back up to the answer, how much is the business going to have to pay in respect of the output tax? That's the 7,000 we just calculated. I suspect it will have to pay some additional amounts as well because of course, they didn't register when they should have done, which means some form of penalties, potentially some interest because that 7,000 of output tax they're gonna pay, maybe it should have been paid earlier if they'd registered. But the question said in respect to the output tax, it doesn't talk about penalties, so the answer is 7,000. As I said before, please, 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 Practice going from net at 20% equals price customer pays, and then take the price that you pay for things in the shops and work backwards and work out how much VAT that you've been paying to that company, which will then be paid on to HMRC and help to fund the schools, the hospitals, the defense, the police, and everything else our lovely country has. Okay, let's now move on to requirement A2. Must the business's customers reimburse the business for the output tax now payable to HMRC? Because what the company could do is go to its customers and say, oh, we forgot to add VAT on this. Now we're going to have to charge you that. No. That is not how it works. That would be totally unfair to customers who've been quoted a price. This is entirely the company's fault. The customers have paid 42,000. Their job is done. They are not due to do anything else. The liability of this VAT falls on the company. So nice straightforward one there. And then we get on to part B, which says complete the following statement by choosing an option. To find out information about registering on a special scheme for VAT, and I'll come back to that in a minute as to what that means, a business should first of all do what? Call HMRC on the General Inquiries Helpline, so telephone look at the website or write to HMRC. Which should you do first? Now, this is interesting, I think, because it seems to me that there are three ways in which you could answer this. If you know the HMRC rules on this, then you'll know the answer because there is a rule on it. Secondly, if you don't know the answer, maybe this is in the reference material and it is 30 pages long, that reference material. So as I said earlier, please don't just turn up on exam day and assume you're going to find things. Do make sure you've had a little look through it first and know where things are. So maybe it's in the reference material. And thirdly, what if you can't find it in the reference material and you simply don't know? Is common sense going to work? Well, if you don't know something about a company, what do you think the most sensible thing is to do first? Website, phone them, write to them. I think it's website, isn't it? 
If there's already publicly available information that's likely to answer your question, why are you wasting your time and theirs writing letters that have to be read or making phone calls that have to be answered? Now, not everyone seems to think that is common sense. I regularly stand at bus stops where it tells you when the next bus is coming and there are maps showing you where the buses go and someone will get on the bus and ask the driver, uh, what bus do I need to get there and when is it coming? So not everyone does go to that information. They like the human touch perhaps, but to me, the website is the most obvious answer. But the thing is, if you look in the reference material on the right hand side of the screen when you're doing the assessment, towards the end of it, if my memory is correct, one of the uh, things on the list says information sources, where to find this stuff out. So it's easy to find. The answer is the website and it's in the reference material. And I remember the first time I went into the reference material to try and find this, I think it took me about 10 seconds. Now that is going to be true for quite a few of that type of question on indirect tax. Go look in the reference material, make sure you read it carefully, but the answer eight times out of 10 is provided for you. Now it's said in this about registering on a special scheme for VAT, we are likely to be meeting some of those special schemes during the other nine weeks of our presentations of LSBF TV for indirect tax. So I think it would be a good idea at this point to give you a little bit of a reminder about them. There are three special schemes for VAT and they are typically aimed at making life simpler for small businesses. Because as you'll see as we go through the other weeks of programs for this task or this set of tasks, Filling in VAT returns, keeping detailed VAT records, etc., is a bit of a pain. It's quite cumbersome. There's quite a lot of administration with penalties if you get it wrong. So to try and make life simpler for smaller businesses, there are some special schemes. I'm not going to go through them in any great detail here, but just remind you of what they are and roughly how they work. One is called the annual accounting scheme. One is called the flat rate scheme. And the other is called the cash scheme. The first one, annual accounting, sort of tells its own story with its title, doesn't it? Typically, VAT is done quarterly. So every three months, you have to fill in a return and then pay over whatever VAT that you owe, or if you are owed some VAT, you reclaim it. So you've got to do this four times a year, bit of a pain. If you are a relatively small company, you can apply to do this just once a year only, which is good news because it's less work. And especially if you owe VAT, not claiming it back, you might think this is good for cash flow, but do bear in mind HMRC aren't that generous. And if you're on the annual accounting scheme, you have to pay estimated VAT amounts during the year. So you actually have to pay an estimated amount of cash. And then at the end of the year, we'll find out whether you've paid too much or too little. So it only has some cash flow benefit, not as much as you might think, but from an administration perspective, maybe nicer. The flat rate scheme works like this. Typically with VAT, you calculate the output tax that you've charged to customers and then subtract the input tax that you have been charged by your suppliers. The flat rate scheme gets rid of all of that and instead you will be charged a percentage 
of your sales revenue with no need to do the output tax and input tax separately. Nice and simple. The third one, the cash scheme, gets around a cash flow problem, which is typically you'll be required to deal with the VAT when you invoice your customers. What if they don't pay you for a while? Under the cash scheme, you're only liable to pay the VAT once your customer has paid you, which for a cash flow perspective is a lot nicer. So there we go. Those are the three schemes. A little bit of helpful uh, memory jogger there before we see them again in later weeks. Let's now bring this to summary. So a reminder of the importance of understanding what is in the reference material that you have available to you when you do the actual AAT assignment. Please, please, pretty please, go and open up a sample assessment on the AAT's website, see that blue ink reference material down the right hand side and get a feel for what is in there so that you can look things up quickly and effectively if you have to. Practice with net amounts adding VAT on to get gross. Five sixths plus one sixth equals six sixths. Apart from that, thank you very much for watching. I hope you found that enjoyable and useful. Best of luck in your studies. And I hope that we'll see you again next week, same time, same place, for some more lovely indirect tax. Thank you.